thinking about what constitutes dangerousness. Have you ever stopped and actually challenged yourself to define what you consider risky or danger behavior or dangerous relationship, dangerous behavior? You know, I haven't actually done that. I haven't slowed down enough. I mean, it's easy to think of people who put us in harm's way or, um, you know, say that they have undisclosed risks and we don't really know what it is. Um, you know, I'm trying to think of other things that would make us, put us at risk of somebody, you know, in, um, sorry, I had to take care of something there. Yeah, I'm trying to think of things that would kind of put us at risk. But what shocked me was when I actually came across Sandra Brown's definition of danger. And I realized that I underestimated the extensiveness of dangerous behavior in dangerous people. Isn't it interesting how we are socialized not to be confrontational, not to call out things that, uh, it's like we're, un, we're impolite, we're, we're not hospitable or neighborly. To, to actually uh, challenge somebody on something that's harmful is distasteful. That's how I feel. I, I find it like it's as if it's distasteful. But let me, let me read what, uh, what um, Sandra Brown is an author of several books and she wrote one of her earlier works is called How to Spot a Dangerous Man. And she also has a workbook called, that goes along with it, How to Spot a Dangerous Man. So it helps you kind of work through the material as you, as you see it. And she defines it in the front of this book, anything, yeah, let me actually find the spot. She says, I've come to understand the term dangerous to mean any person who causes a, her partner or his partners, or her, I'm sorry, anybody who causes damage to their partner's emotional, physical, financial, sexual, or spiritual health. It's not just limited to physical or sexual. We often overlook this truth and we don't understand beyond the violence that what makes a person dangerous is the multiple, multitude of variety of ways. I was stunned by that. I had never really considered the, the non-measurable ways that we are in, at danger, like someone risking our financial well-being or someone causing us spiritual confusion or loss of integrity with ourselves or with the world or with the truth. I hadn't really thought about the ways in which maybe it forces us to compromise our priorities, that maybe we are no longer going to have our best future, our best choices, because we've compromised them in order to preserve this relationship. I hadn't considered all these right, ram, the subtleties of things. Here's another thing it just was brought up because I'm getting ready for this webinar of uh, called "Is Having Sex My Right?" It, it was with uh, Lisa Sony or Lisa Sunny is uh, promoting it. It's hosting it, and we're going to be a panel of us. It includes a pastor, uh, Nat from Mending Me, myself, a sexologist. So there's going to be a group of panelists of all of us from various kind of areas with different specialties. We're going to be talking about sexual privilege, sexual entitlement, and then healthy sexuality. What does it actually look like? And I was talking to a friend of mine who it works in the sexual addiction realm of things. She's very big over there. She has men's groups. She works with uh, betrayed partners. And I asked her for help on the questions because I'm putting together, help putting together the panelist questions. And I was talking about the differences be with her between intimacy and sexual coercion and how does it connect. And one of the things she mentioned was, which I thought was really powerful, is she said, make sure you talk about the difference between performative experience and experiential sexuality. And then she unpacked it. What does she mean by that? She says, when you show up in order to, for the pleasure of someone else, but you ignore your own experience, or you fear the threat of the other person's experience because if somehow they're not happy, then it's gonna have ramifications for you and you will emotionally, it will cost you something emotionally. Again, what blows me about way about both of the examples, the, the definition of danger as well as the definition of what is sexual coercion is the subtleties. How often we miss the subtleties of these areas that are, that, that are emotionally costly and detrimentally affect the relationship. That we like things very 
clear, very black and white. Uh, I'm thinking of examples of sexual coercion. Well, I never made this person do that. So then how is that my fault? Yes, but you threatened them by saying that you wouldn't, you were going to be surly if you didn't get your way. Well, I didn't actually hit this person. I just sort of said that they had a choice between the job or me. Yes, but now their financial his, their financial well-being has been compromised because they forced to choose a relationship, whether to stay connected with you versus versus their own well-being. We don't talk about these subtleties. We don't talk about the subtleties of we talk about we talk about the big areas, but we miss the way in which we compromise or minimize or diminish each other uh, in an unhealthy way, and we fail to see that this is actually forms of emotionally abuse. All of this is a form of emotional abuse. So I'm, let me introduce myself. I'm Dr. Carrie Kermackaboy. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm a, a, a clinical mental health specialist with over 20 years of counseling experience, and I love to hang out with you and, and talk about these issues, uh, what constitute healthy relationship, how do we get healthier, uh, how do we protect ourselves, what happens in relationships. I, all of this is very, very interesting. So I want to take your questions today, and the way to do that is there's a couple rules to this room, but also a way to, a way to actually ask me questions, and that is we don't talk about politics, religion, or my looks. And if you'd like to ask me a question, put a thumbs up ahead of your comment or your questions so that I know you're talking to me, not talking to each other. But thank you so much for joining me today here. I appreciate that. I always love to hear your thoughts and the things that you're struggling with. So as you've been going through life, maybe this week, as you bounce into the new fall, kids are back at school, uh, you're getting gearing up for the end of the year. H how is it going? And, and where are you struggling? What kind of issues are you having? Make sure to put a thumbs up in front of the comments or questions. And by the way, welcome so much, Instagram. It's so good to see you guys here with me today. And I'm so happy always to hang out with my TikTok uh, followers and friends and all of you that may be even new to my platform. So Cynthia wants to know, why do narcissists, are, why do narcissists have tendencies? I missed that. Let me go back. Why do narcissists have so much trouble holding a job? Yeah, I've noticed that, that they often end up um, having a record of lost job. Now, not all of them. Some narcissists do very successfully. I think it kind of depends on the job that they're in. One of the things I've noticed is that they tend to be attracted to powerful positions, uh, positions that give a lot of control, a lot of dominance. Uh, you know, think, I think things that give them a lot of admiration, there's a lot of, um, you know, credibility to it or a lot of they get a lot of kudos for it. Like, for example, they tend to be attracted to things like medicine, politics, um, um, media. They tend to be in the media. They tend to, where there's a lot of, like, control over things. And, and I think when they're in those area, they tend to do well. But, but here's the thing that kind of works against them, is that there's this internal restlessness and boredom. And if they're not kept on their toes and interested as a result of that, then they end up feeling like they, they lose interest. And they also don't think the rules and the, the, yeah, the rules apply to them. So they're more likely to break the, break the policies at work and then get into trouble. Um, you might find them breaching protocols or, um, getting, you know, having inappropriate relationships and, just, you know, maybe even theft of time or theft of resources or, or theft of the project. They just don't see the, it applies to them. They feel like they're kind of extra special. So they get to, they get, they feel like they get to, you know, not have to follow it the way that they want to. I hope that makes sense. And so as a result, they then lose a job or they quit the job or, you know, or they think the job's beneath them. That's another problem I, I've seen is they get into something, they find it's kind of more mundane. See, the same problem that happens in relationships where there's this fantasy about, oh, this relationship's going to be perfect. I'm going to have it and it's going to be really, really wonderful. And then they get into it and they find out, oh, you know, it's ordinary. You have to go every day and you have to stay even when you don't really want to and it's really, really boring. All of that happens. And just like they get interested in the relationship with you, they then get disinterested in the relationship. They get disinterested in the job and then they, they blow it in some way or they just opt out and they quit. So Yes, it's often hard for them to hold jobs, but not always. I wouldn't say that's, wouldn't say that I saw that that necessarily meant I met a narcissist because other people have a hard time holding jobs. But I do think that that's 
not an uncommon thing that happens. By the way, for those of you over on TikTok, uh, when you're a subscriber, and I just saw one pop in thriving in the afternoon, subscribers, their questions go to the top of the line whenever I can catch it, because I know sometimes the comment here section here gets very, very busy. But also, I hold a special subscriber only, not that you can't attend, but I take the subscriber questions. And the first one I'm going to be doing that is on Saturday. So Saturday at 1 p.m. Central Time will be my first subscriber live. So if you can, uh, if you want to come and become a subscriber and have a you know, perk of being seen and making sure your questions are good asked. Make sure you check out that benefit because that's one of the big perks. So uh, thank you so much of those who are subscribers. I really, really appreciate it. And Spiritual Samurai, I don't know if you guys know Keith. He's got a platform both on uh, Instagram and on TikTok, and he's definitely awesome to follow. So Keith is one of these quiet, safe people who just is strong, kind of a strong guy. So thank you, Spiritual Samurai. So Jennifer wants to know, my ex-friend and her girl, his girl are starting drama at my workplace. Why do they do that? Yeah, have you noticed that? That, that people who have a cluster B personality types, as well as most personality disorders, tend to cause a lot of drama. One of the things that we mistaken is we end up thinking that the best attention is positive attention, right? You don't really want to be called out for what you're doing wrong. You want to be noticed for what you're doing right. You want to hear the compliments and be, you know, celebrated, right? Actually, that's not true. Psychology has proven that when it comes to hierarchy of attention, we would rather have even negative attention than no attention at all. To be invisible, ignored, is a far more uncomfortable experience than 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 having negative attention, which for some of us, I mean, for me, that's not true. I, I would not want negative attention, but there are those that really would prefer just being seen even for causing conflict than to not be seen at all. And that's why they cause drama is that it's gotten boring. They feel entitled and, and they, and they like the drama. They like the attention. And here's another reason why arguments are then don't get settled with them. Their goal in an argument isn't necessarily to have closure or to come to some natural good con, con, uh, resolution. Their goal in, the, in an argument is to actually just create the drama, to stir you up and have it be a problem so then they can walk away feeling happier because now they're not the only miserable persons. They've made you miserable too. So that's, that's a one theory why you might be, they might be seeing this drama happening at the workplace is that gotten a little boring. Uh, maybe they, this person feels ignored. Um, maybe they, they feel like they need to ex make sure that you all know that they're that special. So, um, so they're kind of stirring stuff up. Caffeinated uh, misery wants, or I don't know how to say your last name. Caffeinated Ms. Yell, maybe is how you say it, wants to know, are narcissists often the middle child? No, actually that's not true. I wouldn't say there's any particular child in an order you know, birth order that causes more narcissism than another. Uh, it does run in families, so you're going to see a strong genetic proportion to it, but it, it doesn't necessarily have to do with familial roles. That's not true. Disco Biscuit wants to know, are we raising a generation of narcissists by over-validating every possible experience that they have? I do wonder about that. I know what you're talking about. It kind of started showing up in the 90s. When I was having kids, when I saw it kind of make its mainstream, it was Children's First was the public service announcement that actually got played on TV. I know we don't do that these days, but we used to have just these like 10, 15 second clips on TV and they would say, you know, pop up a slogan like Children's First. And and that sort of reminder, sort of like trying to like so change the social agenda by making us different. I do wonder about that. There has been studies showing that the, the amount of time we spend on social media posting, uh, preoccupied with our posts, looking at the likes, all of that, that there is an, it, there happens to be a correlation with an, a rise of narcissism with those of us who spend a lot of time on this platform. So I have a question for you. So as you hang out on Instagram and you hang out on TikTok or Facebook or wherever else, your favorite platform, do you find that it's affecting you? Do you find that you've become a little more preoccupied with your appearance or how successful you are to your neighbor or do you find yourself a little less satisfied with life? Do you find that it has that kind of, are you more envious? I know I have to actually personally watch for that so that I don't get affected by the toxicity of that. 
of co the comparison game and knowing somehow feeling like I'm come out behind. So I'd be intrigued to hear what you think, if you think there's any validity to that. Um, so as I want to jump forward just to make sure that I don't miss, um, miss my, my, uh, those who are subscribers may have asked a question. So I want to, cause I'm 56 questions behind. No, I have not. Okay. So I'm going to jump back. So the next question that came in and I'm also Instagram, feel free to ask me questions. You've been kind of quiet over there. Um, can I talk about narcissistic siblings? There's a lot coming in on families today about family orders and families and what makes narcissism in a family. Um, and what is narcissism? How do we know it's pathological versus just a trait? Yeah. So, and thank you for repeating the questions because if I miss it, it is good that you put it in again so that I know that you're talking to me. I won't assume that you're yelling at me because I don't see it. So, um, yeah, I appreciate that. So let me back up. Let's talk about narcissism. Let's talk about the difference between narcissistic personality disorder versus narcissistic personality traits. I think the best way to think about this is, is think of ego functioning. We, you have a self. The self has to regulate itself and has to regulate how it navigates the world. How much imagination do you have? Are you able to problem solve very well? How well do you... Uh, deal with your impulses. Um, you, you have, you, are you able to have good judgment? Are you able to notice when you're having a problem? These are all skill sets that we are born with that are hardwiring and that varies to how good we are on each one. So think of them like metrics that you kind of have to like, you range on from healthy to weak, or strong to weak. And some of these metrics are really important. It makes us interact healthily with other people. It helps us to see people, recognize them as autonomous people. It also helps us to deal with uncomfortable urges or drives or even just hungers that we may have. We learn how to moder moderate those, how to regulate them in a healthy way, how to, how to not just act out just because we want it. Um, Freud called this the id. I'm not for sure I agree with all of Freud's theories, but he, was, he talked about how we have in, in, internal or instincts that, that, uh, push us and their, their innate drives. And one of them is, you know, obviously the drive to eat, uh, the drive to survive. Another drive would be drive to procreate. We have these innate needs, instincts. Are we able, what do we do with them? Are we, are we able to curve them and, or do they control us? So all of these things define what makes a healthy person. Some of them has, has to do with more narcissistic tendency. Narcissism would be defined as an excessive preoccupation with self. To the, to the problematic level of struggling to recognize and appreciate the selfhood of anybody else. So literally, if you were thinking of this as a, let's pretend this is a map. And on this map, you are, you, you know, there's the pin of you. You are here. There's you. Can you see other structures, other people on this map? People who are sociopathic or narcissistic or even sometimes borderline personality disorders literally struggle to recognize any other person in the map of their life. They, there's actually like a blindness. All they're preoccupied with is their sense of themselves. Are they coming out ahead? Do they get what they think they deserve? Are they being recognized? Are they getting their needs met? They don't recognize your needs or his needs or your neighbor's needs or the coworkers' needs. They don't see these other people. They just see themselves. And then they pursue relentlessly these needs. Now, if we didn't do this at all, if we were a non-self, then our whole function would be, we would be literally uh, like, we would, we would be just an instrument for everybody to use. We would literally not be a self. So we don't want people who don't have a sense of self. You want, you want a well-boundaried, well-defined self. But the other problem is, when you can't then also negotiate and recognize the selfhood of other people, then, then you're excessively aware of self. Then you would be ego, what we call egocentric. It's all about the self. So you want to balance. You don't want to be a nothing, but you don't want to be the everything. Now, how do we all do with this? Well, 
we all are on some varying level of varying degrees in our ability to do this. Some of us do it pretty well most of the time. Some of us do it well some of the time. Some of us don't do it well hardly any of the time. So we kind of vary on that. So we all have, we all vary on what I would say is narcissistic traits. There comes a point when the trait moves from relatively functional, healthy, reasonable, to where it's pathological, detrimental to others. When we begin to actually step on the toes of other people and we fail to recognize that we're doing it. When our self-motivation is such to where we're willing to manipulate, exploit, and uh, um, deceive other people in order for us to have an advantage. That's when we start to cross the line. Is when, And it can be subtle, guys. It, it's not necessarily always the big things that we think of. It isn't necessarily like, um, you know, like I have a secret double life and I don't want you to find out about it. So I'm going to lie and deceive in order to keep you from knowing that it could be just as subtle as I just failed to, let's go back to sexual coercion. I just failed to appreciate that maybe you're not in the mood that you've had a really rough day. All that matters is that I want my way and I'm going to make life miserable for you and the family. If I don't get my way, it could be subtle. It doesn't have to be like the big things. It could be little things. So we all kind of vary on these, on these skill sets. And at some point we cross over. Now, how do you know when you cross over and you've moved from some traits, maybe some, quite a few traits to where you're pathological? Well, that's where the DSM-5 comes in. It has nine criteria and it needs to be pop five, five of them needs to pop positive. But it's interesting is they all kind of dovetail together. If you look at it, it's like literally picking up a Rubik's cube and you're looking at various sides of it. It all still is describing the same, the same crystallized or core problem, which is the recognition and appreciation of other people beyond yourself. So how does it manifest? Well, it manifests by you think you're special, you think you're entitled to unique rules, you're envious when other people get ahead because you think that it's unfair and you deserve it, you're willing to be exploitive in order to get what you need, you don't really care about other people and how it affects them, that's lack of empathy. Um, and I'm, I'm blocking on some of the others how it all manifests, but there's nine ways and you need to have at least five of them. But if you notice, they all are kind of like different ways of looking at the same syndrome, the same issue. Well, how does this happen? Why, why do we have narcissism in the world? They've actually been doing studies on that. They've looked at first the theory was, well, maybe some of us have had really traumatic backgrounds and trauma has caused this. So it, there's actually a, a, a test that you can take called the ACE. It looks at childhood uh, exposure to early trauma. And you can get a score when you can see how you rank or range compared to everybody else, whether or not you've had a, what we consider a very traumatic childhood. They've also considered, well, maybe it's a dysfunctional family. Maybe families cause this is bad parenting, or there's been a big problem in this family, or maybe there's the way that we, the family, you know, attached to each other and took care of the kids. Interestingly enough, they found that that's not actually true, that there is not a strong correlation between Ad, it's called adverse childhood adverse theory. There's not a strong correlation between adverse childhood experiences and narcissism. That there are a lot of people who have adverse childhood experiences that don't become narcissistic. And then there are narcissists who don't have adverse childhood experiences. That there's just not the correlation. So it's been disproven. So then they thought, okay, if it's not nature, I'm sorry, nurture, maybe it's nature. So they began to look at twin studies. How likely is, if one twin has it, is the other twin likely to have it? They actually found the rate of, of, of concordance, the rate that it, one twin having it, if the other twin, first twin has it, is 77%. So if you have a close family relative or especially an identical twin, your likelihood of having narcissism as well is 77%. So that's pretty strong. To give you a sense of how strong that is, let's take schizophrenia. Schizophrenia if you have a sibling who has schizophrenia, the likelihood of you having it, I think it's like 12%. Very, not likely. Schizophrenia, in fact, schizophrenia occurs in 1% of the population internationally. And I think there's another rate is 6%. So if you have a parent who's schizophrenic, your likelihood of schizophrenia is 6%. So not a strong correlation genetically. Yet for personality disorders, they range from the upper 60s to 80%. So high connection, there's a high genetic connection, but there's that range. There's that 23% that don't get it, even when your twin has to, when your twin has it. 
So what they're thinking is that there's some, bi they call it a biosocial theory. They think there's some connection between biology and your social life, your early social life, that's causing this, this mental shift that actually shows up as damage to the neurological imaging. So they actually are neurodivergent because their brains under neuroimaging looks different than those of a more normal population. So that's how they think that it happens. Now, so you have siblings. So what occurs in the family, it tends to run a families and it occurs in the families. Now, what does it happen to the family when a sibling is, is schizophrenic, or I'm sorry, is narcissistic? Well, it would cause a lot of disruption you would see a lack of responsibility. This person, the sibling, your, your brother or sister would cause a lot of drama. They probably would get in trouble a lot, or they might be the golden child. You might see this person that they can do no wrong. They're like the perfect image. So I would, I would expect you to either see sort of a black sheep dynamic, or you would end up seeing the golden child dynamic. So either they walk on water and they do everything right and their parents are like, oh, look at them. Aren't they so great? Why can't you be more like them? Or I think you're going to experience them as constantly keeping everything stirred up. But I would think there would be a lot of manipulation, a lot of subtle deception. You'd be aware to the degree that they're causing, you know, making mom and dad think one thing when the truth is really something else. I think there'd be a lot of that that's happening. That's very problematic. It gets stickier when you get into adulthood because then there becomes increasing leverage. So it wouldn't be uncommon for people to say, to sort of demand holidays go a certain way, to have odd rules around relationships with their children. I mean, I can imagine all sorts of ways that this would have ramifications for once as you get into, as you get into adulthood, but it gets really, really tricky. So great question. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate that. Um, it is complicated. It is very complicated. The test that I mentioned, did I mention a test? Try to think, did I mention a test? If you guys know what test I mentioned, please let me know. Yeah. Oh, and Rose here. I'm so happy. If you guys don't follow Rose, you should definitely do. And Brittany, bringing, Brat, Brittany, bringing back Brittany is another really great account to follow as well. I'm super excited about the webinar coming up with Sandra Brown. That's what Roe is talking about. So on November 10th, Sandra Brown, who wrote Women Who Love Psychopaths, and really, if you read the, the, the subtitle, Inside the Relationships of the in Inedible Harm with Psychopaths, Sociopaths, and Narcissists. So this is anybody who fits what she calls the, the dark triad of personality problems. Now, don't mix that up with dark triad personality that's actually something else. And I'd be happy to talk about that if you want to talk about the dark triad personality. But there is a triad of personalities that cause problems, and that is psychopaths, sociopaths, and narcissists. Now, people often ask, well, how is a psychopath different than sociopath? And some would even disagree that there is any difference. I think that's always very interesting. Robert Hare, in my opinion, is, oh, the ACE test. Okay. Robert Hare would be, I would say, is a really great author that talks about the difference between psychopath and sociopath. I know I tend to get it wrong. I get it mixed up. I usually assume part of it I part of it I understand correctly and part of it I don't. So psychopaths are ruthlessly cold and they really don't need your admiration or ad attention or love. They're not looking for that. They're not driven by that. They're just uh, driven by their own agenda. They're very, they're pr very perfectionistic or very obsessive about certain things. Need excessive control, very dominating, and they're they're ruled by that desire. Where sociopaths are more volatile, uh, more reactive, you set them off. Whereas a psychopath, he may be or she may be just have an agenda. And if you get in the, as long as you don't get in the way, they're probably going to ignore you because to them, you're like an ant, you're a nothing. So they're not really particularly bothered by you. They just like ruthlessly pursue their agenda. Whereas for a sociopath, if you stirred them up or upset them, then they'll lash out and become highly destructive. Now, both can harm people. Both are dangerous potentially, but a sociopath is more volatile. They have more of a mercurial attention. So I'd be that, so that group, they're both scary, but that group is really scary. The test I mentioned was ACE, ACEs, and I don't know what it stands for. Um, and I bet you, you can find it online. I just have, uh, I haven't personally taken it, um, but it, it, it assesses childhood, it assesses childhood trauma. Yeah, the, the ACE test for trauma, and here it is. 
Yeah, ACE is what it stands for. It tallies up the different types of abuse, neglect, and other hallmarks of a rough childhood. And I believe you may be able to find a similar online version of it. One thing I just found, for all, those of you who follow me know that one thing that Sandra Brown found in her big, huge study of 600 pathological love relationships, she gave, she gave the victims a personality inventory. It's often referred to as Ocean, O-C-E-A-N, or it's also called Big Five or the Five Factor Test. I found where you can actually take it online. Two versions of it are online for free. So if you're really interested in that, um, I'm going to I'm gonna put up those, those links in my link tree so that you can take it. What you want to watch for is what she calls super traits. And these are the things we're going to be talking about in the webinar, which is November 10th. It's called um, How Could I Have Fallen for a Dangerous Man is the name of the webinar on, Oct on November 10th. November 10th at 630 Eastern Standard. I get confused because I have the sexual coercion webinar on October 20th, and then this is November 10th. So I was like, oh, the 10s and the 20s confuse me. Anyway, so if you want to know, if you want to come, I'm going to back up and start over. If you want to learn more about sexual coercion, all the ins and outs, the subtlety of it, how does it differ from intimacy? What do we do about it? What, what, how should we think about it? All of that. That is, is having sex my right? That is October 20th. And the link is in my bio, and I'm going to be a panelist on it. And then on November 10th, I'm interviewing with a, several other panelists, and Roe is one of them, Sandra Brown, the author of um, Women Who Love Psychopaths, and she also authored How to Spot a Dangerous Man. I'm going to be interviewing her on November 10th. We're going to be talking about How Could I Have Fallen for a Dangerous Man as the name of the title of the webinar. And we're going to lo be looking at things like, why are we attracted to this group? What what about this group do we sort of underestimate? What then makes it really hard to leave this group? And how do we spot them better so that we don't get into a relationship with them again in the future? How can we protect ourselves better? What things are we not recognizing or we're minimizing or we're not we're not placing enough value on so that we can protect ourselves better in the future? So if any of that sounds like in Roma or if you're just interested in learning more about psychopathy. Now, the thing about Sandra Brown is I did a six plus hour w webinar with her, seminar with her, and um, she spent 30 plus years studying psychopaths. This has been her life's work. She's worked with victims from uh, psychopathic abuse and narcissistic abuse, but she's also worked directly with psychopaths. So she has an inside view into the way that they think that I, I've met very few people who know this, this, this population as well as she knows this population. So I personally cannot wait because for I don't know if many of you have seen this video. Um, I grew around grew up around psychopaths, not so much narcissists, but more psychopaths in my life. My step grandfather was very psychopathic, scary, scary man. My grandmother, who married him, I would say scored pretty positively in the psychopathic realm as well. So she was also pretty cold and, and ruthless and not afraid to break rules and the law. And then my father had some tendencies of it too. So I was put into frequently dangerous situations where literally like my life, no kidding, my life was on the line multiple times in my life. And uh, it was weird. Growing up in that environment was wild. It, um, it, <laughs> Wow. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's, yeah, I, I don't, you know, yeah, I, I don't even have words to talk about it because it's so strange. It's such a wild experience to, to be around psychopathic people. You know, they, they have rules that they expect you to follow and they expect the ways. And then the, even what they decide is reality, what truth is, it's not truth. There's a version of things that they have, and then you're supposed to run their, your life around them. Here's a weird one. One of the one of the weird rules of my family, you weren't to you weren't to be sick or suffer. That was a no no in the family. It was sort of like just thought of poorly. So you were expected to tough it out and ignore pain and move through pain, and nothing was that bad. Literally, the 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 saying that was openly said frequently around that house is, unless you were dying, like bleeding to death, or throwing up, then they didn't want to hear about it. Um, so, so when I was eight years old, I ended up having pneumonia and I didn't know that nobody knew I had pneumonia. 
They didn't pay attention. I had a cold that had gone too long, and they sent me to school. And I fell asleep in class. I was so sick, I, I fell asleep. And the teacher stepped by and happened to put her hand on me and realized that I was burning up, sent me down to the office. And I was picked up by one of my parents who then chewed me out all the way home for bothering them, for calling them to pick me up from school. Well, I was really sick. It became apparent that I was really sick. So I, they took me to the doctor's office to be seen by the pediatrician, which we didn't have insurance. And this is back in the 60s where it just, the healthcare wasn't the way that it was. So everything is out of pocket and very expensive. And we we're a farm family, so we were poor. So that meant money out of the pocket that nobody had. But he said to my mom, he said, she's really sick. And normally, if you weren't uh, a medical specialist, I would be hospitalizing her because that's how ill she is. But because you're, you know, you have this expertise, I'm going to be sending home. And on top of it, I need to give her a medicine. So does she want to does she want the oral medication or does she want the pill? Well, I knew that if I took the oral, the, the liquid, that I would be weak in the family perspective. So I asked to take the, the pills, even though I'd never learned to swallow pills. <sighs> Disaster. It was awful. I, I, it was every time I had to take, it was one of those you had to take four times a day. It was a, every time I had to take it, it was like one of those choking, gagging, try not to throw up situations for me. I knew I should have said the liquid, but I knew that the family rule was you don't go liquid. <laughs> it was awful. It was awful. And then on top of it, I was allergic to the medication. So that meant I was, oh, it was just, you know, but nobody paid attention and I didn't get any help. And I just sort of like had to navigate my way through it. It was severe, severe uh, neglect in my house, unfortunately. So I'm fascinating. That was a long ass story to tell you that I'm super fascinated by this webinar. And I hope you'll join me. I think it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful night. Um, so the links are in my bio. And I also think the one on sexual coercion is going to be really interested. I know it's a hot topic. I know it really, uh, you know, people have strong feelings about it on both directions. And so I, I can't wait to get into this nuts and bolts of what is it? What is intimacy? Here's a question. One of the questions I, I know that we'll probably be talking about. I'd love to know what you think. Uh, do you think sexual sexuality is a relational experience or a, is a solitary experience or is it both? So think about that. How do you express your sexuality? Is it, is it actually in a context of a relationship? Even in the fantasies, is it in a context of relationship that, or not? So that's the stuff I hope that I can't wait to get into that really talk about. So I hear that, that Queen Elizabeth passed away. I, I'm seeing that keeps popping up on my feed that that's happened. Wow, she lived a really long time. I have been really enjoying the um, HBO series called The Crown. Kind of Now, I don't know how close it is to the truth, but I've appreciated seeing all the, the difficult, nuanced to what it would be to be a monarchy. And uh, now I don't, maybe I'm wrong, maybe what, but I keep seeing it. it comes up over and over and over in this feed that that's happened. I could just check real quick here. Um, yep, she did pass away. It's in, it's in the BBC News. I just, she passed away. They announced it today. Um, yeah, she was 96 years old. Wow. She assumed the role at 25 and then passed away at 96. That's a long, long time. Yeah, it is very sad. I'm that that will be wow. That's a big that's a big moment in in um, Britain's history. Very big, very big moment. So let me go back to ask take other questions here. And uh, thank you for those of you who kept make, trying to make me aware of it. I'll never forget um, the day that the Boston Marathon bombing happened, and then something kind of. Uh, there was a big moment, and, and those of us who weren't paying attention on social media accidentally may have put out feeds or tweets or that wasn't really appropriate, that was ill-timed. And it, I so thank you for making me aware of this and that I could pause and say something about it. I really appreciate that. Yeah, Dr. Vanderklok would definitely talk about, I'm going backwards, guys. <laughs> That's when I'm reading the comments going backwards. Dr. Vanderklok definitely refers to the ACE. It's a, excuse me, it's a standard test that we give to, to understand somebody's level of um, traumatic history in life. So it's very, it's very mainstay. It's been around a long time. Um, I've not personally taken it, partly because I know my score would be high. So, um, 
Yeah, I've had a lot. Unfortunately, unfortunately, I've had a lot of traumatic experiences. Okay, Moroccan princess wants to know, how do you leave a narcissistic family home? I have technically enough money to leave, but I'm afraid of failing. I also think, I'm going to make a hazard a guess, Moroccan princess. So Moroccan princess, sorry, I'm having one of those days. I don't know if you guys have days where just your words are like, fight you. Everything I say fights me today. I knew that earlier. I was making some TikToks and reels and I found it was hard to speak there. I thought, oh, this live's going to be a fun one because <laughs> I can't string words together very well. Um, but so is your question. I have a, I'm have. i going to hazard a guess that you have another reason why it's really hard for you to leave. I have a suspicion that not only are you afraid of failing, because that would then bring a lot of shame, a lot of embarrassment, plus they probably predicted that you would fail. So you would have that. You'd be at the mercy of their their abuse or their, their um, contempt around it. But I also think that leaving co has consequences, that it's going to jeopardize their feelings about you and uh, cause you to, to come, come under scrutiny and be even seen as maybe somebody who's not a supportive person, not a, not a appreciative family member because you're probably breaking the rules in some way. So yeah, it's tough. That's that's another reason why people find it hard to leave these relationships because, because you know, everybody says, just leave as if that's a magical answer and it's just that simple. It never is that simple. There's all these ramifications, all these hidden agendas and hidden strings that we know that once we do certain things, they're gonna be incredible costs. And we also know that many of these decisions are irreversible. I don't know if in your situation, if you step out of the house, will you be able to, if it doesn't go well, will you be allowed back in? For sometimes, for some of us, once we make a move like that, that door behind us is now not just shut, it's locked and bolted. We're not gonna be able to get back through it again. We've like permanently burnt, we've burned the bridges with that person. So maybe that's another fear you've had is you don't wanna burn the bridges with your family. So the advice I would give is to know all of that, know the risks you're running, but don't let it become controlling. That's the hard part. It's easy to say because it's so fearful, so so much fear associated with it for you that then just to not do it at all, to say, I don't want to then just do it because I can't risk that possibility. You need to do what's in your own best interest and know this. Know that the people around you who really have your back, who really truly love you, will be there for you. It may feel like you're doing this completely on your own, but you're not. You have communities, places that, of people who really, really care. And if you lack that, if you happen to be kind of lacking that, and thank you, Brittany, and for bringing this up, I do have a private community called Toxic Free Relationship Club where we're very vulnerable in there and we champion each other and encourage each other. And there's very honest discussions of these types of things. So if you are lacking the support like that, you can certainly find it in my group. There's a coupon code to get $3 off a month for three for the first three months. But that's what I would do. I would not let the narrative, whatever the story is that you believe will happen, what they're telling you will happen, I would not let that narrative then control you. Let's go back to my story about me asking for the pill medication instead of liquid medication. I knew my best interest was to go with the liquid. I knew I didn't know how to swallow pills. But I let the family narrative, the family rule, control my behavior and then paid dearly for that. If you don't step out and you know that it's time and you have the money and you know you're ready, mostly ready, for you to be controlled by the family's story, the family's rules will then now negatively impact, it will hold you back. And maybe even ways that you don't actually fully appreciate or see yet, but it will ha it's a limiting belief. And that limiting belief will then have other ramifications that will limit you in other areas. I should have been my best advocate for myself. I should have asked, even at eight, I should have asked for the liquid. But our job always is to be the best advocate for ourselves. And that starts with you doing what you need to do and knowing whatever they're telling you is not necessarily true, that there's a whole lot more behind it. And there are people who, who care, who got you, who are best, who are very interested in your success, including here, including us, and including uh, those strangers, you know, strangers. So thank you for asking that. I'm, I'm thrilled that you're able to ask and I hope let me know how it goes. I really would like to hear how it goes. Um, yeah, she said, I have a deep fear of becoming homeless. You know, the chances are, if, you, if you've already been living at home and been know how to save and do well on that, I, I, I see that as prediction of, 
of, um, of success. So very much so. Zulu asks, what is schizophrenia? Schizophrenia is a mental condition. It's a, it's a uh, condition of the uh, mind, emotions, and sense of reality. Um, it's not very common. You won't see a lot of it. It's, you know, pr you may never meet a person with schizophrenia, actually. So you, you, you're more often just to see them in the hospital because they get admitted to for medication adjustments and stuff like that. All right, any other questions for me today? Um, oh, so thriving in the afternoon, you're going to get coaching. That's awesome. I'm glad you're going to go get certified. I, I, there's a really important role for coaches. Very, very important. I was listening to psychologists talk about, this was interesting. I need to go find the research on this. So I'm just sharing with you what I heard from someone else. So it's hearsay. I haven't gone to see the comment or the research up right, but they were saying that the, those who those who approach coaching carefully and have supervision and are serious about it and get training, often the outcome of therapy or for the coaching of the clients is similar to those who see therapists. That they have they have a they play a very very important role in the in the the continuum of care. So I, I think it's I know that this is a, a great way to increase access for mental health services, and so I, I'm very pro coaches. I think that. I refer to coaches just as often as I refer to therapists, very much so. So in, in India, Jade wants to know, is a multiple personality the same thing as schizophrenia? No, actually it's not, but I know why you're getting the, the confusion, and it's a confusion related to the name. Um, the name schizophrenia means schizo means split, and phrenia has to do with mind, so it means split mind, but it actually isn't mean a split, split personality. It means that their their sense of their reality, connection with reality, has been fractured. They're experiencing a fragmented uh, view of life and uh, what's real and themselves. All of that has happened. So usually there's there's always hallucination or delusions, as well as a whole host of other symptoms like loss of motivation, uh, usually poor self care. Those types of things happen with schizophrenia. Multiple personality disorder now is referred to as DID, dissociative identity disorder, and that is where they have uh, there's strong dissociation to the point where there's multiple kind of states of self that present as different personalities. Um, financial abuse typical for, is financial abuse typical for narcissists? I would say what's typical for a narcissist is anything that keeps you under their domination. Now, for some of us, it might be the threat of them leaving us. For others of us, it might be the, the lack of having financial independence. Um, it could be for somebody, somebody for someone else, a lack of social supports. But whatever they, they can maintain ultimate control over you are the things that they're going to be managing. It is common that financial abuse is tr very much a part of it, but it may not always appear the way that you think it appears. Often people think, well, they just limit my access to the financial accounts so that I'm blind, or maybe I don't know how much my partner's bringing home in his paychecks or even where the money is going. But it also can include um, limiting your access to money, like, like not wanting you to have a job or making you have to bring home receipts and justifying everything that you spend on, making you highly accountable, keeping you on a strict budget and not living, letting you have control over how that budget is created and what where the money is spent. So it's not just limited to some areas that we think about, but it could be more subtle areas. But yes, financial abuse is typically part of the part of the abuse that happens. What we call as ambient abuse is part of the ambient abuse. Um, I'm trying to go back. There we go. What about narcissistic mothers? My ex-mother is horrible and constantly blames everyone. Yeah, narcissism, I'm trying to think of the, the rates of narcissism among men versus women. I think it's somewhere between 60 to 70% men, but then the other percent is women. So it does occur a lot, probably more often in women than we think. I think we often don't consider women as narcissists. Um, and, and because they're relational, they tend to be a little, be more, a little more sophisticated when it comes to navigating it. So it might be harder to recognize where it's not just like blunt force. I think men tend to be more straight on blunt force. Women tend to be more tricky in the navigation, more backhanded, more passive aggressive. 
so it tends to be very very hard to uh, recognize oh um, yeah not just mama the best way to ask me a question here is to put a thumbs up ahead of your comment and then I know you're talking to me because I, I, I you're too far away from the you're too far away from it so I can't touch the comment button oh yeah I see that it is there but that's why I ask um, I ask for people to please put a thumbs up ahead of it so I can see it but yeah it's so it is hard so narcissistic mothers do the same dynamic of manipulation try to control they control things about family access the holidays how you you know who, who spend times with whom all of that is sort of being managed by a narcissistic mom but also they're managing their reputation how they're being perceived um, it's it's very very subtle but it's also very very toxic very damaging so yes it's pretty common there are some good resources of uh, Jasmine Corey is one that I recommend another good book is by Lindsay Gibson the adult children of emotionally immature parents um, here's one I it's it's a, called the emotionally immature or emotionally absent mother this is the one I was just referring to is J Jasmine Corey Jasmine Corey another good one is um, mothers who can't love mothers can't love this is by uh, this is why Susan Forward wrote this one, Susan Forward. And I mentioned Lindsay Gibson, Adult Children of Immature Parents. This is, I highly recommend her. I got to hear her speak. She's very, very good. She knows a lot. I'd like to interview her. Uh, I think that would be very feasible for me to pull off. So those are some books that you can be able to get as resources. Um, oh, yeah, not just Mama. Sorry that you didn't hear it. But, yeah, put a thumbs up, and I'd be happy to take your question. I'm going to be here for about five more minutes, so I will watch. I will watch to see if there's your question pops up. So are they truly schizophrenic, or is it drugs? No, schizophrenia actually is a real thing. It has some unique features to it. I got to see it. I used to work at a psychiatric hospital, so I saw quite a few schizophrenics. I actually got to talk to one who was a, a, a lawyer. He made his, his life practice his law, and he would come in and get med adjustments. And I found him fascinating, very intelligent guy, very observant about himself, so he could describe what it was like to feel it. So can drugs cause schizophrenia? No, no, that's not true. It can help precipitate a schizophrenic break. So if you have the predisposition to schizophrenia, and then you start to abuse drugs with all that mind-altering, yes, you can help trigger a schizophrenic break but it wasn't the drugs you already had a predisposition to it there are a lot of people who use drugs who do not have schizophrenia as i said it's a rare a more rare condition it's not that common um but schizophrenia is more of a they think it's kind of a um uh, it's more genetic biological it's kind of a biological error and that causes it and your first break usually happens after the age of 18 but before the age of 40. So if you have a psychotic break after the age of 40, actually something else is going on. It could be maybe trauma or a, some kind of brain condition. Maybe you had an accident, maybe something else. But uh, it, so it, it happens the first time you have a schizophrenic break. It happens in a certain window of time. But it's repeated. You're going to have multiple episodes of it, and it needs to be treated with medication. That really is the only way to manage it is through medication. So it's very sad. It's heartbreaking when you see it very heartbreaking I remember my first case of seeing it was shocking to me I felt so bad it was an 18 year old guy who just went to college and he had his first psychotic break and was was admitted to the hospital we didn't the first time that you have a psych psychiatric break we don't always know that schizophrenia sure enough he was in six months later with it again and then he just became a regular client as they adjusted his medication mm. so flower lady asked a really big question this is a question a lot of us deal with and uh, I'm going to take this question as the last question for today. So how do I forgive myself for falling in, into a relationship with a toxic person, with a narcissist or a psychopath, sociopath? Yes, we all feel that shame. Partly is because we're hardwired to want to protect ourselves for survival. So the idea that we would get into a relationship that put us at risk, we feel responsibility for that. It's sort of an innate reaction that we have that it that healthy people make good decisions. But here's the thing that you didn't appreciate or really understand, that you probably assume, like I assume, like a lot of us assume, that people generally are good-willed, well-intended. We also assume that when we meet someone, we met the real person. 
But unfortunately, that actually both of those, those assumptions are false. It's hard to walk around the world and imagine that not everybody is well-intended. It's unpleasant. It's an uncomfortable feeling to assume that. I don't like living in that mindset, but we need to keep it in the back burner. We need to keep it in the awareness of it so that it, it is a, something we could ask ourselves. What is it in this person's best interest for them to have a relationship? What are they going to get out of um, knowing me and being close to me? What possible benefit does this give them? So we need to have at least a level of minor skepticism for us to be able to be, start to be more sensitive and pick up this. The second thing is we need to ask ourselves, to what degree is this person presenting what I want to see versus what I'm seeing their real self? Now, all of us do it to some minor degree, present our best selves when we meet new people. We don't, you know, you, you shower, bathe, brush your teeth, maybe even spray on cologne or perfume, right? When you go meet someone new, even a friend, a new friend. We do that. We all want, because we want people to like us. But, but more deceptive, nefarious, exploitive people are coming with even greater determination of making you like them to be, and begin to present who, not who they are, but rather who you want them to see. So as a result, you, uh, you end up then seeing yourself reflected back to you. You didn't know that. I didn't know that. Part of it is, and this is what I, well, I'm going to, again, I'm going to re-mention again that link. I'm going to put a link in my bio so you can go take a personality inventory, the big five personality inventory, as well as, or it's, big, it's called factor, five factor inventory. Go take it and see which ones you pop high on. I don't want to tell you which ones, but I'm going to talk about it more next week. Chances are there are two indexes. If you've gotten into an abusive relationship, you popped high on that you score and then Sandra Brown, don't cheat and don't go find out what Sandra Brown's super traits are. Please wait until we talk about it. But Sandra Brown says there are two traits that are almost always universally high among victims who get into these relationships. These are the things that predators actually are looking for. They're looking for your hard wiring as a person that makes you more susceptible to being, believing in the goodness of others, for you to, to want to um, connect with the world for you to assume people are well intended for you to be uh, patient with people really believing in their good nature and and believing that people can change there they look for that that is not naivete guys that's just you being a really wonderful person but predators look for that predators are sur so it'd be like saying you know say for example wolves are, are hunting a pack of bison they're going to look for the people, you know, the edge, the sick ones, the old ones at the back, the young ones, and take them down. Is it that that bison's fault for being having age or being young or being ill? No, it's the predator's responsibility for the behavior that they exercise. Your person you got into a relationship knew they were exploiting you and didn't care. That's where the shame belongs. The shame belongs on them, not on you. But, but after these relationships are over. We do need to get better at identifying who is dangerous and doing a better job of protecting ourselves. That's on us. So if we find ourselves getting in repeating relationships is because we haven't done the hard, uncomfortable work of understanding where our vulnerabilities are and doing something about it so that we're less vulnerable in the future. And that's where this webinar with, with Sandra Brown is so pivotal because those are the things we're gonna be looking at and that's what her work, How to Spot a Dangerous Man is all about how to protect yourself better, how to identify where your weaknesses are, where your childhood experiences are so that you don't then have a blind spot when it comes to meeting these types of people. That's what we're going to talk about in that webinar. Great question. I really appreciate it. I'm going to right now exit, go put that link in my bio so you guys can take that test. I will say, I'll put it in the title of it of personality inventory, free personality inventory. And it will take you to another site where you can take the test. Let's come back and talk about it. I can't wait to hear what you're scored. I'll share my score and let's talk about risk factors. And until Saturday, for those who are subscribers, uh, live subscribers for TikTok, I will be with you at 1 p.m. on Saturday. And otherwise, for the rest of you, I'll see you on Tuesday at 1 p.m. Thanks, guys. I hope you have a great, great weekend. And I'll talk to you then. Bye-bye.